Yes, that was back in the day, actually. That was just before I got hit by a car. Wow. <laughs> okay, I am ready to listen. I guess everybody is uh, eager to hear your talk. Please go ahead. Certainly. Oh, let me share my I'm sharing. You are, oh, good. but not Excellent. in the presentation mode. Yep, I'm getting presentation mode now. Okay. There we are. So I'm Brent Worth. Uh, I'm the uh, co-founder and uh, CTO of Substrate AI. And don't do that. Uh, sorry about that. And uh, I worked, uh, let me see, view, 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 slideshow. OK, it got very excited there. So um, working with uh, May, who uh, helped me to do this presentation, uh, and the, the, the uh, my goodness, why am I having technical difficulties now? So I'm going to escape this and just do it like this, since okay. Mother Nature does not want to play nice with me. So yes, uh, yeah, we all know about games. Everything's been going great. Uh, we've made some fantastic achievements in uh, video game playing technology uh, from Go to uh, Go Zero and uh, DeepMind's uh, StarCraft II AI, Alpha Star. Um, our work, however, is drawing more on um, basically the, the human brain's ability to use emotion in decision making processes. Yeah. Okay, and one of my inspirations comes from definitely from Antonio Damasio's work in the 1990s that showed that what emotions were not only just part of the decision making process. They were critical to the decision making process, which is kind of was a mind blowing experience for me. So in this, I derived some thoughts regarding what I kind of wanted emotion to do. And in my mind, I saw it as kind of like guiding decision making process. And in this, I kind of broke it down to goal selection, uh, attention and action inhibition, actually, the, the free won't, as it were. Okay, from Ya teníamos eso, nada más que... I'm sorry, if you can hear you. Hizo, y ya hicimos como tres cotizaciones y... Uh, no les this is your presentation talking. I'm sorry, can uh, everyone hear that? Yeah, we hear that. Is it your presentation talking or somebody else? Oh, it's... it's uh, I think it's... Uh, uh, I forget his name now, actually. Um, the one that's doing the pick of two. Uh, try two. Ah... So, is Mike still hot? Felix. Oh, yeah, I got So, in that, we're basically positing that intelligence is effective, okay? It's used to prepare the organism for actions. It changes different parts of your system to, like, increase your breathing rate, moving blood flow away from your stomach and to your extremities uh, in case you had to be involved in a fight or flight. Um, it's, you know, critical in being able to allowing you to make decisions. Uh, people who had impairments in the amygdala uh, and other parts of the, the limbic system uh, found it very difficult to choose between two candy bars, for instance. Okay, so it was just amazingly debilitating uh, condition to have. Um, it allows you to kind of marshal and coordinate different attentional systems, like where you need to be identifying the threat, where you need to be identifying the escape route. And actually, it plays a role in our ability to construct uh, social groups. Admittedly, Facebook might be a bad example of that, but there we are. Okay, so emotions integrated into our agent's context, having positive and negative valence. Okay, so this is creating the, um, the context by which we start to select our our different goals, uh, the, the most current goal, not like the universal goal, it's more like a, a sub goal. Okay, the next goal to achieve, okay? But it reduces our cognitive loads, okay? And allows us to basically focus the con uh, on the context that's most relevant to our particular task. It could be survival, it could be drinking a cup of coffee, it could be driving down some crazy uh, uh, commuter uh, in Austin, Texas, okay? Um, we also break it into different uh, models, okay? So instead of having one model that solves everything, it was important for us to basically break the problem into sub-problems, okay? And I'll show what we, uh, how we broke that down specifically later. And these tasks and contexts that they actually kind of create drive into the subsequent uh, models, which refine and basically 
improve the agent's ability to make decisions. Okay. This is the basic high view of how our agents built. Okay. Where we have the arousal and emotive model that represents our affective system. Okay. Um, this basically models the changes in reward over time. Okay. The output of this actually sets uh, what the goal model uh, values are, and well, not know what the values are, but uh, creates a context, and the goal model learns what should be the next uh, goal I should be trying to achieve, irrespective of how I achieve it. Okay, it's not connected to the actual app, the the world context, uh, world action space. I'm sorry. Okay, which in turn helps to define what kind of intentional and affordance, action affordances that we need to be able to solve this problem, okay? Uh, should we be focusing on the bear who's a threat to us in the forest and try to identify some route to escape, okay? And then the action affordances here is where it kind of like, what should I, should I do in a particular context, which actually uh, turns out to be very important actually in performance of the model. Um, the experiential model is, is just the highly updated or highly enhanced state and action um, uh, of the world model, okay? So it basically is responsible for interacting with the world, but it gets its state uh, modified by the intentional model, okay? Then basically any uh, the sub goals it's set, uh, which helps to define or to select or prioritize different behaviors, okay, over uh, others based on proximity to a goal. And then our action manager, which actually, um, basically based on the output of the experiential model, will determine whether or not that is actually a valid action to take within the current context. So as I said, our effective model is actually a combination of two models, okay, which right now are very simply modeling the change in reward, uh, first and second derivatives, okay? Uh, in the social circumstances, we could actually create a, a a different kind of award, for instance, that actually kind of models that aspect and include it in this particular model. But for this case, this is our simplest version uh, of the agent, okay? And it's basically, its output in terms of target values for what kind of emotional state should I be in in the next time step, okay? Grades, um, the next context, which is used by the different submodels below it, okay? So the goal learning model is basically, as I mentioned, just specifically taking its current previous experience and then simply selecting what is the next state I would like to be in, okay? Irrespective of how those states are connected, okay? And kind of the easy way of how we implement it is just a, a single head, you know, kind of searching around, okay? And the agent kind of learns to find which values work depending on the particular uh, context uh, as well as the affective context that it's in. Okay. And next. Or you're not going to listen to me. Okay. So the attention model, okay, uh, is, 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 is learning from its prior experiences and the affective uh, context that it kind of rolls in, as well as the goal, okay, that it's trying to achieve, and then identifies which features are relevant, most relevant for its particular problem space. Okay. So kind of uh, show you kind of like how the masking process works or how the actual attention is actually computed. We actually uh, maintain an internal value of like some kind of big, big int, okay, which represents some number, okay? And we have a collection of state features which represents different aspects of the world, okay? Uh, it doesn't matter, it's, it's respective of anything you want, okay? And then we generate, um, we move this value by the, the agent moves this value around, and then we basically convert it into its binary representations and then add it to represent, okay, which features we actually want to attend to. So it basically learns how to be able to identify where its masks need to be based on the current context it's in. The action affordance model is really interesting because, um, well, I didn't include it in our results. It actually plays a really interesting role in our um, one of our applications, which is in stock trading, that uh, the agent's ability to prevent it from actually performing an action was actually hugely relevant or important to making optimal trading decisions over time, especially given the stochastic environment that we're dealing with in stock trading, okay? But like the attention model, the mask is computed in basically the same exact way. You have an integer, we uh, move that around, 
And then we just simply, you know, take its binary representation and add it to the actual action space that the agent can interact with. And these are the actions that we are enabled based on the X, uh, no matter what the experiential model outputs, these are the actions that are actually only uh, performable by the agent within context. Okay, so our results of this model uh, yielded, to, uh, was on a, um, this particular test data was collected for a five by five mini game of board, of, of code, sorry. Uh, we played 10 game series, each with 500 games per series, okay? And our model was able to do about a little over 22% uh, improvement in terms of win-loss ratio. And then basically after the, the average of 500 games, we're about 800% uh, more performant in terms of total cumulative uh, Q value earned, okay? So in addition to uh, this particular test, which is actually just a very small toy example, okay, we actually use this model in a number of applications at Substrate AI. Okay, one is uh, our financial trading applications, and we're in the top two to five percent uh, on average. And the, these models have been trading for the past three years. Okay, we've also been using it successfully in ag tech applications and others, uh, including uh, renewable energies. And uh, it's been really kind of exciting to see how we can actually apply this technology to a, a diverse and basically uh, uh, un kind of like defined uh, problem spaces. Future work, uh, we definitely, since this is our prototype uh, agent, uh, we definitely have identified some interest, interesting aspects that we can improve from a core functionality. Okay, this paper uh, and the, the core learning algorithm only represents part of the whole world architecture. Um, we want to, we're working with May and her group to be able to kind of demonstrate, to reproduce this, as well as demonstrate it on, uh, on a larger scale and different applications, okay? And um, we're going to improve uh, some of our uh, assumptions, including like how the affective model works, be more uh, biologically uh, accurate. And that is it for me. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Now, do you have any questions? If I can ask a question, thank you for this interesting presentation. But what, how do you define a goal? For humans, goal is a system that affects reward calculation with different goals. People interpret the same state as different kind of rewards depending on the goal. Do you idea of the goal affects reward calculation? It does. Uh, so since we include the affective context, and it's actually, it's a great question. So a goal is actually um, in our system is just the collection of states that the agent has experienced, or actually, I, I won't bring it in. Well, okay. We also have synthetic state generation, but that's not in this particular model. Okay. But uh, basically, let's just say that's just the collection of states that the agent experiences and the, its association with its affective context. So you could actually have, uh, let's say, for instance, I walk this trail all the time. It's a wonderful trail. Nothing happens. It's very peaceful. Okay, so you you have an affective context, okay, which is very positive, neutral. Okay, there's nothing going on. You have a very positive experience. But let's say you're in that same environment and you have, let's say, encountered, let's say, a bear or a wild hog, okay, that this also creates uh, a new state which has a different affective context, but also has different attributes in the, in, in the world, which is you have a bear or you have a hog in that environment, which has changed how your effective interpretation of a particular state is, okay? So this system uh, allows us to be able to even take the same world, essentially, and depending on how you, that world has evolved, okay, uh, say if they can have different um, uh, ways in which you've entered that state, as it were, uh, we can pull in the different affects, okay, for your decision-making process. So let's say you run into this bear or this hog frequently, more frequently in the future, Okay, so instead of you walking tranquilly through this, tra this trail without any kind of care in the world, your uh, arousal system will be more elevated, okay, contextually speaking, because it's seen this bear and this hog in this, in this particular environment. So on average, you're uh, um, more concerned about looking for ways to, to escape. Thank you. 
Uh, does that help? Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask May, are you going to talk too? No? Uh, no, for the most part, Grant will do the talk. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Then um, I have a question, yeah, uh, Alexei. Sure. Uh, uh, Brent, uh, what happens if your goal is an optimization goal? Something like I want to get the maximum amount of food that I, I want to collect. Uh, how, how are you going to, to cope with a, a goal like this? So, okay, great question. So right now, the actual value which is associated with a particular state is also associated with the external reward of the environment. Now, that being said, uh, I was talking with May about that it's possible through like your own internal representations uh, that you may actually be able to change what that actual value could be. It doesn't necessarily have to be the, the, the external environment, but that's right now uh, that state actually ties the external reward from the system right now. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, one question from me, I recall. Uh, Sometimes when a person performs a task, he or she does not direct attention to what he is doing, but uh, possibly to something else. According to your model, the attention must be always focused on, on the object of the task. Do you see any, a discrepancy here? So now that's actually a good, good question there. Um, First off, just because I'm intending to say the car doesn't mean that my motor function underlying that is having to be uh, doesn't have to attend. Okay, so my motor system can be com is still functioning. Okay, uh, it's, it's actually pulling off like your cerebellum where you're able to still walk, even though your attention might be actually directed towards somewhere else. Your attention can also be internally focused. Okay, something I can't bring up in this particular slice of the model is where you can actually have split at internal and external attention. And that's actually at the higher level uh, uh, part of this actual total agent hierarchy. Okay. Um, but it's not, uh, it's not managed by this piece. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So if there are no further questions, we uh, should now start our last technical session for today.